the novel we're about to discuss, uh, Let the Right One In, does contain subjects of pedophilia and extreme violence against children. So if um, any of these subjects that I just mentioned are triggering at all, please feel free to skip them. Um, as always, listener discretion is advised. Uh, thank you for your support and feedback, and I hope uh, you enjoyed the show. Welcome to Darkly Lit, where we discover how easily secrets can flow out when placed under just enough point and point pressure, just like the blood under your skin. We are the host of this fucked up spooky boat club. <laughs> um, I am your first host, Kayla King. I am joined by my husband, uh, David King. I tackled the Royal Ram, baby. And our uh, best friend, Sade. 274 elephants on a teensy spider weave. <laughs> a teensy spider weave. Weave, you're right. <laughs> a teensy spider weave is a spider that really enjoys uh, uh, anime. Oh my god, that sounds so cute. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm eager to get into this. <laughs> we're here, we're, we're here, we're deer, in, it caught in the headlights, and <laughs> If you haven't guessed by that <laughs> strange conversation, uh, we just finished reading Let the Right One In by John Avide Linquist. So. Yeah. Because uh, talking about anime and weeboos, it revealed all that, right? Yeah, of course it did. Because, you know, that, that factors <laughs> so much into the story we just read, you know? Do you want to give a summary? Uh, I guess I will. I'm going to do the best I can. It'll be a little disjointed, but I'll do my best. I mean, the story is fairly disjointed. Not in a well, bad way, though. Not in a bad way. No, by this point, all of the disparaging, we have sort of all the subplots are kind of coming together a little bit. And especially that's true at the end. Obviously, uh, we, we are now at the beginning of part four. Um, Hawken has just fled from the hospital, but he is nowhere to be found, uh, at least at first. In the meantime, uh, Virginia has begun to fully transform into a vampire and is becoming familiar with what it, that sensation feels like. Uh, Lack has gone to uh, Gusta's place in order to drink and um, get, you know, get over things with, um, you know, as, as Virginia is recovering. He's you know, sort of freaking out in his own way. Uh, I'm just kind of placing where everybody's at at the start of this before I, I delve further. Uh, Tommy is looking for another opportunity to, uh, you know, show up Ste Stefan. St Staffen, Staffen. Yes. That's right. Staffen, because he does not, he still doesn't like him, which is totally fair. There's another character named Stefan that pops up That's, in the story as well. Thank you. And yeah, no, St Staffen, his would-be stepfather. Um, and, uh, of course, there's um, our good friend Oscar, who is now coming, slowly coming to terms not only with Ile's existence as a vampire and as a boy, at least based on, you know, what he's learning but also the idea that his old life is pretty much gone. And as he keeps saying, I don't exist. Like he's have going through these parts. He's going through a, a you would almost say a, a crisis of identity and a crisis of, you know, reality as a lot of characters do during the course of this. Needless to say, they're all their worlds kind of come crashing together in different intervals as Virginia tries to eat Gosta, gets attacked by all of Gosta's cats, throws herself down a flight of stairs and gets taken to the hospital where Lack, uh, while he's with her, has to deal with her, um, you know, not surrendering to the consciousness of a vampire that is slowly taking over her, but letting herself burn alive when the sunlight comes through the windows, and she requests that the blinds be opened. Tommy pulls a prank in uh, church at a, at a mass and uh, hides out in the basement that night, where he is eventually meets uh, Eli, who asks, who agrees to pay him basically to drink some blood so she can survive another night before leaving because she's ready to leave. Uh, she knows Hawken is coming. Uh, basic, and it all culminates with Hawken arriving. So there's some crazy, violent, horrifying stuff that happens, but ultimately, uh, Hawken is dealt with. Ile flees. 
Oscar has to deal with Eli leaving, but then also in the book's climax has to deal with, oh, and, and Lack dies, by the way, gets eaten by Eli. And, <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, uh, Oscar still has that loose thread of Johnny and his older brother, Jimmy, who decide to straight up fucking kill him, basically. Will he get out alive? Well, if you've all read this before, then you know he does, but not so much Johnny and Jimmy, because yes, Eli did not leave him. Eli returns at the most, the best possible time to save Oscar, and uh, the book has a very bizarre, dark, but also kind of happy ending in a weird way. It's a very twisted, bittersweet ending. Anyway, that's my summary, and I'm sticking to it. Also, there was a ram on the front page of the paper. This is crazy. Okay, I read all this... I stayed up way too late last night reading this these last couple parts, and then this morning. So um, it's really good, but I'm also it also deprived me of a lot of sleep. So, and even when I went to bed, even though I wouldn't finish it, I was still thinking a lot about the rather grotesque things that happened. So, how are we gonna begin this? I mean, should we go through it through each characters like we did before, finishing with Eli and and uh, Oscar? Like- I. I think that's probably for the best. I think mm-hmm. that's the best way to do it. Who do we start with, even? I think we start with Virginia and Locker. I agree. And I think we should then head to Tommy, mm-hmm. followed by Hakan, then Ile, and... Oscar? Yes. Okay. Because uh, their story already ties into with Johnny, which we can... Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> So, like you said, poor Virginia is she's, she's completed her transformation. She went to go kill the cat hoarding guy. Uh, that scene was pretty intense with all like the cats. I do like that we we had that set up prior with the old lady who had the cat, and the cat was like, "Oh no, I don't like you." And then Virginia obviously didn't know that cats are now her sworn enemy. Apparently, <laughs> why is it uh, the author decided to make cats a sworn enemy of? The vampires. That's a very interesting choice to me. That's not from any lore that I recall. For me, it reminds me of the whole, like the, isn't it part of Egyptian lore that cats are kind of like the guardians of the underworld? And so like if an undead entity sees a cat, it's like, oh shit, I'm in trouble because the cats kind of like get your ass back in hell. Oh, that's Mm. an interesting. I mean, that's what it made me think of, of like, you know, cats, you know, being at least perceptive of like, oh, you're undead. You're no good. I always think of that part from the Brendan Fraser mummy where the cat walks across the piano and Imhotep just goes and runs away. Exactly. (laughs) It's like one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie because it's just a cat walking on a piano and it freaks him out. I don't know. I'm delighted by when people freak out at cats. I was just thinking that maybe it wasn't just cats alone. Maybe all animals uh, react badly to vampires, but we haven't seen any animals react to Elay outside of cats, so it's hard to say. That's true, but we we do get one really weird little bit where we get a, the perspective of a squirrel. Oh, that's right, I and, forgot. About and that. the squirrel's like, "What the hell is that?" When he sees the squirrel, uh, yeah, the and that was a weird little scene, wasn't it? <laughs> where uh, so we know Hakan was uh on the run, or the corpse, the reanimated corpse of Hakan was on the run. After he got away from the hospital and he like crawls into like a hole at the base of a tree or something to hide uh-huh. from the sun. And that's where we got the perspective of the squirrel. And for some reason, I just picture this like happy little Disney style squirrel being like, what was that? Yeah. Like um, I was getting I was getting some like um, sword in the stone vibes. In, like, yeah. My, my headspace. Exactly. I kind of want a picture of this like a sword in the stone style squirrel looking horrified at this like demon vampire this melty zombie. face monstrosity yes that yeah. is Hakan. yeah but the the squirrel had no idea what it was if a cat had been the one who saw him down there the cat would have been like oh hell no yeah do you think the only reason that the only reason the cats attacked was because there were such big numbers of them like i thought was there's always that thing that's like animals know when something's not right mm-hmm. so the cats mm-hmm. just sense this unnatural presence i, I like that that's a part of the lore that to me, kind of makes sense in its own way, but is never really explained. There's some mm, other things that yeah. aren't really explained either, but they don't have to be. Um, but there's all the other things that are that I find really fascinating. I want to talk about that kind of in this bit with Virginia, because it's with Virginia that we we get... Like, I'm starting to realize the reason that I feel like Virginia's bit is in the story is so we can see what happens when someone turns into a vampire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
I think early on you might suspect that we would have seen that with Oscar, but we we obviously we didn't. Yeah. There is a point where Oscar thinks, oh, I'm turning into a vampire because he accidentally touches Elay's blood, but it turns out that's not the case at all. No. But with Virginia, it's a full fledged transformation. Um I, I'm one of the things I was glad about, um, because I uh on Twitter I asked uh people um, if you have any questions, please let me know. We're going to be recording soon. And like most Twitter posts that we post on for Darkly Lit, we add a GIF, usually associated with the book somehow or with the theming. And I was so glad there's actually a GIF of um, Virginia being bitten by a cat from the movie. And it's just amazing. <laughs> the GIF, I was looking oh at God. it and I got some like almost like Evil Dead vibes from it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was just going to say, I was a little iffy posting it because I was like, oh, that looks horrifying, but the cat clearly looks fake. Uh, like, this is clearly like a puppet cat, so, or almost like stop motion cat. So. Again, Evil Dead vibes, mm-hmm. you know? Mm. Yeah. Didn't, uh, that scene where we, where Eli was going to feed off the, the old lady, the cat there, didn't she lock the cat in the kitchen? Yeah, she did. I feel like she did that because she knew the cat would have attacked her if she didn't. I wonder if that may, ties in with that ties in with something. It's it's neat that you Eli would know that that cats fucking hate her, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but we we don't get her perspective in that part until a little later, if I recall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but on Virgi- in Virginia's case, I think what's interesting is as she kind of analyzes herself. And we understand what's going on. I think for me, the most fascinating thing that comes up is the idea that uh, these new kind of invasive cells are forming in the heart, but they're like brain cells. And that there's another consciousness, another presence forming in Virginia's heart that if she surrenders, it takes over. And that's where the ravenous vampire comes in. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely enjoyed the parts with Virginia in that. She she spends we see her transforming and like fighting these new urges that she has and she concedes and she almost like I guess would would that have completed her transformation in a, in a sense like mentally because she was ready to kill someone to satisfy this hunger. I mean, there's been legends that um, vampires don't fully become vampires until they get their first kill or they mm-hmm. s- suck the blood of a victim. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's always been a part of lore, or... I think that depends, that just depends on your lore, if that's how you want to have your vampire set up. Like, when it comes to lore, I feel like you could have whatever roles you want. I meant more in the, like, in Virginia's mentata, mentality, like, would would that have been the moment that she finally just let herself be consumed by this this new primal, animalistic, parasite mm-hmm. <laughs> Um thing that's taken over her and if she had succeeded there would she had the nerve to later on let herself burn up in the sun one of the more fascinating parts if i recall is that she sees like the infection almost as a living thing Mm -hmm. i mean that comes up quite a bit that this whatever is living inside or whatever disease infects both elay and virginia is almost like a living thing and that's a horrifying thought in itself. Yeah, it's why, like, you know, again, it's I, I, it's it adds credence to the idea of why driving a stake through a heart instantly kills a vampire when so many other things do not. And I guess removing, you know, they say, you know, in a lot of lore, cutting off a vampire's head was supposedly a way to keep them from reanimating. Mm-hmm. So there's some connection between the brain and the heart, but the heart can almost last on its own as its own entity if the brain shuts down. And that's when they go all full, all just raw, I'm going to eat you kind of thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and, you know, there's another bit that's explored in Elay's, um, in Elay's bit that we'll get to, but I liked that the image of the heart as a brain was what creep was, I thought found really creepy. And I liked the idea that it was another intelligence, another, cause the infection was just another intelligence invading. I mean, almost like Buffy vibes. Cause the whole, wasn't the whole thing with Buffy, like vampires aren't really people. They're just like, demons masquerading in human bodies of people who used to be human i think that was how it went anyway doesn't matter vampire lore is different everywhere you go they just try to play with the beats different ways and um i like what lindquist is doing here with the the like almost like zombie infection vibe of the whole thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this leads to an interesting image of virginia being covered in cats it almost is kind of (laughs) humorous yeah it is 
Um, but it does lead her to get into the hospital and she gets a full blood transfusion, which does lead her to actually get the blood she needs. Yeah. To live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was kind of like a, I mean, a weird saving grace for her, but it's also, I really feel like it, it came down to like, if she had gone through with it, then she probably would have, you know, kept on living as a vampire. But because she was kind of spared from it, even though she got her transfusion, she didn't go through with the act of, of killing anyone for that blood. Yeah. Um, so she was able to, like, retain herself long enough to put an end to it. Mm-hmm. The thing about the the whole heart thing, like the maybe the vampire virus or whatever we're going to call it, being in the heart, um, isn't there some, like something about memories or something possibly being retained in in the tissue of the heart because like i remember i've heard stories and this maybe have been discredited already and i don't remember where i heard this but of like people who've gotten heart transplants like suddenly having cravings or things like allergies that they didn't have before but the person they got their the heart heart from did like maybe food that they really love that they had never had in their life before, but now they're like craving this one food that they've never had before. But the person they got their heart from was like their favorite, favorite food. I don't know if that's just like urban legend, but I know I've heard that before. So that's <laughs> kind of what I was thinking of with like the heart being its own thing and having its own, um, I don't know, ambitions or, or motive, I guess. I don't know. But kind of cool. I don't know. If, if that's true, that'd be awesome. Um, I know a lot of authors tend like to play with the whole idea of uh, someone had a heart transplant and this go leads them to go find the person who gave it or like learn more about them or something. So I mean, mm-hmm. it's a, I mean, it was recently a common trope in that one Christmas movie that came out last Christmas, apparently. Oh, was it? Oh yeah. <laughs> Isn't there also a uh, there's a horror movie where someone gets like an eye transplant or something and now they can see ghosts or something because of, I don't know. I don't remember it at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, that's I've heard the that trope before. It's like, oh, you receive the body part of someone and now you have this ability. Remember when they I, I, this is going completely off topic, but remember when they made that. Cartoon Network movie based around that whole premise of this little kid getting basically a, a version of Walt Disney's mind. Like this, th- this, oh, this is a real premise. Yeah, that where, was where I kid you not, this twelve-year-old kid gets a brain transplant and is transplanted with what is the equivalent of Walt Disney. It's not actually Walt Disney, but like a you know a famous mm-hmm. cartoonist. Yeah, and then apparently this kid sees cartoons now. <laughs> it is a baffling movie, and I'm surprised this exists. I I only I didn't think about it. I've never seen it. I only saw it, know about the premise, and now I wow. I, I've actually seen it, and it's it's a weird movie. I'm sure it and is. And then they made a TV show out of it. They did. Yeah. Oh, I, what the I, shit? I didn't know it was that popular to render a TV show, but apparently it was. So apparently um, that sorry that is a completely weird tangent to go off of but it's that whole idea like this is going to transform you into something and then actually in uh, that sort of way vampires are kind of like that too yeah where... i mean yeah and it's like here's my blood and that transforms you yep mm-hmm. there's a there's a bunch of different ways you can play at that trope it's like oh i lost my hand well here's another hand oh no it was the hand of the ha- serial killer now i'm gonna kill everybody <laughs> <laughs> well, look at Eye Zombie. She eats uh, brains and then starts to retain memories of those uh, of the brains that she ate, and actually starts to take on their personality traits and everything for a short period of time. No. Oh uh, yeah, that that actually works as a premise, surprisingly. But... Oh, it does. I mean, I remember like I I don't remember who it was, which of the zo- like classic zombie people it might have even been Romero. But the whole reason so many zombies want to eat brains is because when it do- when they do, it restores their humanity for a little bit. But then it decays again, and they have to eat more brains in order to retain humanity of some kind to restore it. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, because it's like That's eating good. intelligence. Anyway, mm-hmm. but Virginia and and Lack, this is a very tragic. This their whole their whole story has led to nothing but tragedy when you think about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Besides the goof, the the relative horror, but also goofiness of Virginia being covered in cats. Um, 
I that scene for me was not fun or no. goofy because no. I was like those poor cats. I'm like, oh god, cats are getting kicked and thrown and like ah. Uh... There were an awful lot of cats though, and that you know, you know that this was set up to have this scene specific scene happen. Like I thought yeah. Go- Augusta was just the weird crazy cat guy and I'm like there but the pay the payoff to that was really satisfying with just cat cat catamari demasi. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so we get Virginia in the hospital and and then at this point Lockard is not leaving her side. Uh he even insists on having a bed cot or whatever put in the room with her so he can stay there with her. Uh and then Virginia has the window blinds open and she just bursts into flames. And from there, are we going to, cause then Locker, he sees the newspaper that shows Hawkins face. Yeah. And he's like, I got to find him and kill him. Yeah. Cause he recognizes him from when he bought him drinks at the bar. And I think there was something else. Like he recognized, he knows where, yeah, he's, he saw them at the Chinese restaurant earlier in the book. I remember that part. And what's I know we're jumping ahead, but that's fine, because this is just a discussion at this point. I want to talk about the arc. And yeah, he, he, he gets drunk, and he goes to Elay's place, and we get to see... Actually, before we continue with that, I want to just address one part that I actually found very lovely, but it's the part where Virginia tells um, Locker he, she loves him. Aww. And mm-hmm. it's, just, it's a very like short paragraph of just... Showing their final moments together. Oh, and yeah. It's just a very sweet moment. I feel like she did that on purpose, knowing, like, her saying, I love you, was her way of kind of sealing her fate. Like, if this is how my life's going to be, I'd rather end it. And if I'm going to end it, this should be my final moments is with him. That was great. It's just, it's too bad that she she wanted him to, she wanted him to not be in the room when she went up. But mm-hmm. the but- nurse wouldn't wouldn't take him out, so... So, and they, it's actually, it's really genuinely heartbreaking when, um, he's there with, uh, with Morgan and Larry and he, they describe the way he's crying, like just the absolute, so like in the, and screaming in the, in the apartment on the mm-hmm. way there. And I'm just like, oh my God, the, the way it's described is, is like, Lindquist does such a great job putting the grief, the absolute grief, the like soul destroying grief of this up there. And I was like, wow, they really, it really came across. It was built up very well to show yeah. Locker loved Virginia and they did have a romance. They did have a connection. And when he lost her, it makes sense why he would feel such grief, why it would be such painful. It Very few stories can do that well. And mm-hmm. the fact that they did this well and it's a side story of all things. Yeah. I'm impressed. We're, how, do, how do you two feel about the way that things ultimately ended up for Locker? Like the fact that he hmm. got, well, let's be honest, he got fucking eaten. <laughs> yeah. I think we kind of knew, I mean, the second that Virginia was attacked and we we're like, oh shit, she's changing. We knew it was, it was just going to be a tragic ending for both of them. Yeah. I think either Virginia, I think we we're all pretty certain Virginia's not going to live as a vampire and eat. So that means Lager was either going to live alone the rest of his life. Or kill himself, or get killed in pursuing uh, Eli, and that's exactly what happened there at the end. Is he went after Eli, and didn't turn out well for him. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, it it's it's fitting. I wouldn't have wanted anything else. Yeah, it's just it's funny that it all we had all this build up, and it just ends with Eli eats him. Eli drinks his blood. He dead. No one but us realizes how significant that is. You know how much we followed this one character for like. Like, Oscar doesn't really know who he is, apart from that he's a neighbor. Eli doesn't really know who he is. It's just, like, it's interesting that we have this big, deep glimpse into this person's life. And they, you know, obviously it's still a tragedy, but at this point, their body count's already been so high that it's just, like, who is this character to them? It's interesting. It's like the the reader-character disconnect, you know? And it's not Mm -hmm. a bad thing Mm -hmm. either. But it's, like, it's, it's interesting. Have you noticed, did you notice in these parts how much the tense shifted in organically i mean between different sections like whenever there'd be a page break sometimes the tense would be present sometimes it would be past tense and then sometimes it was epistolary and you'd be reading like ma- newspaper articles and reports and i noticed it happened before like he changes the writing style every so often just in little ways and i, I think that actually works really strongly for the novel like it doesn't feel like an afterthought he's not changing tense mid-sentence or mid-paragraph or anything but like 
there will be one in past tense where it's talking about what Oscar did, and then it'll jump to someone else, and it'll be talking about what they did, they're they're doing in this moment, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. What did you think of that? I think it, I think it did help to because we early on it was mostly from Oscar, but then as we start to move through the story and we're being introduced to all these characters and side plots, having those shifts in perspective from paragraph to, or from section to section. It really adds to the, oh, we're looking at this story unweave from so many different perspectives. Uh, When you say it, when you pointed it out, I was like, that sounds like it would get difficult and frustrating, but it actually just worked really well. So I I took no issue with it. I didn't even notice it. I didn't even realize the shift even changed, which is interesting because usually I would pick up on that. So the fact that he did that subtly says a lot about his writing. So. Mm -hmm. Is this the time to move on to Hawken? I think before we get to Hawken, we should go with Tommy. That's uh, right. No, no. Let's let's go with. They're kind of side by side. Yeah, they are, which is interesting because who ultimately is the one that finally destroys Hawken? It's it's Tommy. Uh, yeah. If we're gonna talk about Hawken, I'm going to do a warning here. I feel like I always have to do a warning when it comes to Hawken. This one's fucking intense, and Hawken is the worst imaginable monster in this whole story <laughs> other than other yeah. than the, the the blonde wig vampire that created elay so remember when we began this uh journey the question was who do i feel sorry for more hawken or oscar uh-huh. this is why this is why i because i remember this very vividly and i was like no definitely not hawken mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. i i didn't want to say it because that would spoil a lot yeah but you can understand why now. I definitely understand why now. So before we get into this, for any listeners, um, we will be discussing pedophilia and... Sexual assault? Basically almost rape. Yeah, basically, yeah. And if that makes you uncomfortable, you can turn it off right now, and we will not blame you one bit. Mm-hmm. To dance around it a little bit, I want to actually touch on that, because um, at a certain point in there, when Ile is finally able to fight back against this this thing, this undead version of Hawken. Mm-hmm. Because Ile determines that, oh, his brain is gone. What is Hawken? Like, we... Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Because Hawken has died. I mean, Hawken has blood sucked, but he hasn't changed fully into a vampire because he was able to enter the basement without being asked to come in. So... He's, he's not a vampire. I don't think he's a vampire. Because if he was a vampire, then his instinct would have been to feed, not to fuck. Because, yeah, his his brain uh, splattered across, like, concrete, and he's dead. Hawken is dead. The moment he hit the ground, he was dead. What we have, what is, like, shuffling around and pursuing Eli is an undead corpse that is being sustained by that heart, that vampire heart, but its only pursuit is Eli. And to dominate Eli. See, the, the thing to me that I think is symbolic about that is the fact that when Eli, you think at this point, because what we know about vampire logic is, oh, at this point, it's just the heart controlling him. It's just the instinct, the infection. But then Eli destroys the heart, and that does nothing. It doesn't stop Hawken at all. So you got to wonder, well, then, is it the brain? Is is somehow just Hawken's basest all that's just making him go? I think it's point. less his brain and more his head, and not the head that's on top of. The I mean, yeah. is it is it something across the entire body? Because like we get to the coroner's report later on, and they're describing like the tissue still having like little muscle spasms, even though it's like just bits of broken up tissue. Yeah, God, that it, so. It, it's so horrifying. It's mm-hmm. so legitimately it horrifying. Like it really made my skin crawl. And I think to make it. Even more over the top. Um, before this all happens, Ile is wearing Oscar's mom's yellow polka dotted sundress. And just imagining her in a yellow polka dotted sundress while this is all happening just makes it even more terrifying. I don't know why. I, I think it gives her more innocence as a result. Actually, before we begin with that, should I keep calling Ile her or him? Because there they, is a. They, you're point- right. There is a point where once Elay's uh, origin is revealed, the book refers to Elay as a him. Yeah, I mean, I I think in conversation it doesn't really matter. It's like how you, I, I think to Elay it doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but I think the book, for some reason, the book decides to shift to to the male pronouns, maybe because Oscar just thinks of him as male now. But um, I don't think it matters too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, Elay, it's. I mean, Elay even said, "I'm not really either." Honestly. Yeah. Like, try. I. I don't. At a certain point, I stopped defining Elay sort of by gender in my head. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. just because that seemed to be. Elay's thing, but like the it is interesting because you can see you know I noticed really really noticeably the moment where the where one paragraph it was her and then without missing a beat it was he him. So mm-hmm. the interesting part is the reason why I think so much with gender with Elay is because gender is placed strongly upon Elay for the most part. I mean that's true. Oscar becomes attracted to her. She is a skinny thing with long hair and presents as female, but then reveals themselves to been born male and okay, um, spoiler and <laughs> if you're this and, very deep with us, you definitely read the book, I hope. I hope. Um and yeah, I probably should do another warning here because this is also pretty graphical as well, very violently graphic. As a child, had her penis and balls cut off and ha- is now completely flat down there, does not have a groin. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the fact that there is a switch from she to he, but then she chooses to wear a yellow sundress. Like some of the clothing choices that are described are specifically either very masculine or very feminine. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the author does this on purpose. Yeah. I mean, I think that's done to show that it it really doesn't matter to Ely and Ely doesn't see themselves with a gender because at the, at the age that they were transformed, they would have, they would still have been like right before they started exploring like their own gender and sexuality. So I feel like Ely just doesn't acknowledge that. And whether they're choosing the rock t-shirt they found or the pretty sundress, I think it just, I think Ely chose the sundress because they thought Oscar might like that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't, I think for Ely, it's really more of like, for Ely, it doesn't matter. There is no gender for them because they don't, there's nothing down there to define them. Yeah. And it's more of what gender everyone else is projecting on them. Yeah. They don't have a, they don't have a gender and they don't have a a sex person. Yeah. Correct. So. And not only that, like like you mentioned, this was before they were able to explore the sexuality. I mean, probably before uh, Ely even went through puberty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, they were only 12, and that was that's just at the precipice of when men or women would go through puberty. So they're forever to remain as this genderless child. Yeah, it's... 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 It's fascinating, and and, and Ile re- continues to be. I think one of the things I think that's important is Ile continues to be a sympathetic character because mm-hmm. it's like again, she, she, he, they, they're driven because they just want to survive at this point, and the things they've done. It's like you know, I think it was interesting when when Ile is described as having met another vampire. The way that there's you know, we we learn a little bit about how. Ile has hibernated for a long time, that sort of thing. By the way, did I miss something? I don't know why Ile's dick was cut off. Was that ever explained, or I... It's kind of hazy. I I get the impression that, like anybody who is a lot of power and is also a vampire, uh, the vampire that turned Ile was just kind of a, a creepy asshole. And um, for lack of a you know, more strong term... And, but, you know, the other thing that, that I know that was horrifying about that scene is the vampire drank from the bowl that caught Elay's blood. Mm-hmm. So that might just be, it's probably just a, a, it's like a ritual thing almost. I mean, there was, there was a whole thing about a lottery and dice rolling and like, it just seemed like this is some arc, like Oscar's only getting the impressions that Elay got and we never get the full picture either. Mm-hmm. So yeah. We don't know how Ile escaped. We don't know how Ile. We don't know if that that thing is still out there somewhere in the world. It's it's interesting. It just seemed like that was this vampire's preference and in, in how it likes to feed because it's a sadistic monster. Um, it's a monster. 
And Hawkins. Yeah. Hawkins a monster, an absolute monster too. And that, the reason I bring up the whole brain and thing is that when you really think about it, the, the heart, it's not the infection. I mean, maybe it is the infection, but whatever Hawkins has become, it's still Hawkin. Mm-hmm. And it's still just everything else has been cast aside. And now it just, it's just a, pri- it's just got that primal urge for Ile that it's, it's, it's really bad. Didn't it get revealed that also Hawkins did something to a nine year old? Like, I saw that brought up, and I was like, wait, did he? I mean, he was saying before, like, oh, I hadn't done anything. I'm not stupid. I just got caught with child pornography. I think they confronted someone who Hawken knew that was on un- that was under scrutiny for having done something with a nine-year-old. I think that's what oh. it was. Oh, yeah, that's what it was, because I'm pretty sure it was Hawken had never actually done anything. Yeah. Because, okay. uh, you know, in the beginning of the book, Hawken ran in some circles where they did solicit um, that's right yeah yeah but he never worked up the nerve to do it himself yeah which is i mean he goes from like this like figurative monster to a literal child raping monster yeah mm-hmm. um which was damn no it was so I was, it was so uncomfortable oh yeah it was so skeevy and i was just like i just and, and it's described in detail and poor Ile and well it, it makes it all the more satisfying when Ile stabs him in the fucking eye with the Nothing happened. Thankfully. Nothing happened. It, it almost, got really close. Yes, and that's that's still horrifying in its own right, and that'll scar Eli for a long time. I mean, not like there's a bunch of other things that have scarred Eli, but yeah, there's a lot of eye stuff that happens in these two parts that make me really uncomfortable. But anyway, uh, I have a thing. Oh with yeah, eyes. you have a thing with eyes, huh? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, um. You know that adds to the horror. Can we? Is is it fair that we 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 dial over to to Tommy? I think if there's, if there's anything left left to address about Hawkins, we'll probably hit it once we talk with about t- how Tommy and how this was kind of the climax of his story. Because yeah. like up until this point, I was like, okay, Tommy, why are you here? What's what's going on with you? You don't want your mom to get married to this at uh, this cop and like. We know his father died and he has this kind of weird uh, thought of like death and like fear of death in a way. Mm-hmm. And then he ends up. So like you mentioned in the summary, he was hiding out in the basement um, after pulling a stunt in church. And Eli goes down, trades some money for blood with him. And when he comes to, he hears Eli coming and hides he makes the mistake and, of hiding in the room. Yeah, in like this extra room down there in the basement. And then when, so Eli's down there when Hawken shows up and Eli doesn't defeat Hawken. Like she, they barely escape because they were able to lock Hawken in the room with Tommy. And I didn't realize that at first until it switched back to Tommy's perspective and he's trying to open the door and he can't get the wheel unjammed. And I was like, oh no, Tommy. Oh no, Tommy. <laughs> um, that was the that was the biggest monster movie part right there was the phrase. Yeah. The tense moment where you're like, oh God, you don't know if Tommy's going to die or not or what the yeah. hell's going to happen. Yeah, oh my God. But it, we, we, it kind of comes together in that he at first mistakes Hawken for his dead father. Yeah. Oh, God. That, I really enjoyed that scene just because it was very gripping in that you're, you're imagining yourself in the dark the way Tommy is and just knowing that there's something in there and it's trying to find you. And it was just, it kind of also made me think of, um, have you guys ever seen, um, is it called Wreck? Record. Oh yeah, the 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 one that inspired quarantine. Yeah, right. Yeah, the Spanish film or the I mean they're they're almost identical. They just yeah. Anyway, so either whichever one you like, whatever. But yeah, the quarantine. That's so the scene at the very end where they're like in the the attic and it's like pitch black and they can't see and you know the thing is in there. Like that was the feeling, the same kind of tense. I just yeah. that was so good. It was like Kayla oh, and I are mm, both nodding. I haven't read horror like this in a while. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> It was, a, I think, a, a different kind of horror from the previous scene. Both the creatures are played by amazing actors. You got Rec in Rec. He, it's played by Javier Botin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, who has um, Marfan syndrome and has played like Mama and a bunch of others. And then the, the toe lady from fucking. Yep. 
scary stories. <laughs> Which is awesome. <laughs> and then the other one is uh, played by Doug Jones, who is also awesome. Like, uh, our our uh, Shape of Water uh, fish man. That's right. You need you need someone like to get them. look really grotesque in makeup. You get Doug Jones. Also, whenever I think of Doug Jones, I'm always going to think of our friend Ben Padding because apparently there was a point Ben Padding got his hair cut by John- Doug Jones. <laughs> I don't know why. Just you guys haircut by Pan. So <laughs> that's pretty rad. I I will always remember that story. Mm-hmm. How about Tommy fucking losing it after he beats starts beating yeah. him da- dead with the the shooting yeah. trophy? Yeah, and we don't. We don't get to see him again after that. We just hear of him. Oh, he's coming home from the hospital today, and we don't, we don't get anything else from his perspective. So no. we don't know how how he's doing at the end of the book. We're, I mean, I'm happy he's alive, but oh boy, that is a mind scarring experience, though. What he went through too, you know, mm-hmm. like the fact that he's in there and he's counting 277 times. He's brought this uh, this little that little song about the elephants. Mm-hmm. And he's crushing the, and he's just over and over again crushing Hawkins' like splattered corpse that's still twitching with um, the trophy. I think the creepy part is when um, I think it was it the cop or it was Staffin. It was Staffin seeing Tommy singing that song and then saying the creature kept seeming to come back to life, and I'm like, oh my goodness, Hawkins is not dying. This is horrifying. Yeah, I don't even know if when he was brought to the morgue, he was dead. It, it's possible that the only way to to kill it 100% is fire, is for it to burn. Put the remains in sunlight and watch them go yeah. into ash. Yeah. Jeez. But even, yeah, yeah. even the other ways that yeah. you traditionally kill a vampire don't work on Hawkins, so he's something else entirely. Mm-hmm. God damn. I mean, we're making that assumption. Well, the the creepy thing, too, was when... Was when um, but that that entire time, Hawk, uh, I mean, this is on top of everything else, but Tommy even notices, and this has been, it's been a long time since all this stuff happened, um, Haw- Hawkins still erect, and he's yep. been erect the entire yep. fucking time. Yep. No, okay, that scene where, where Eli's just, like, watching it in the, watching the thing in the doorway, and it's like, oh, it's erect. I was like, ha ha, lol, that's funny. And then it's like, oh, it's jerking off. Now, like, I was like, what? Well, she, oh my god. No, Eli starts laughing. And then that's when yeah. Hawkins just smacks. Oh god. Oh! I'm so glad Tommy beat that thing to a pole, but I feel bad for Tommy. I also, the, the, the other part that made me cringe, this is more connected to Tommy, was, was learning that, was that thing about Staffan realizing that buried under the good Christian idea that he has is this seriously scary, I have to control my anger or I will get violent guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I didn't like him. No, at all. Like, I was kind of, I was on Tommy's side the whole time, but also I, I kind of get it. The whole stepdad thing. It's terrible. <laughs> you know, generally speaking, the moms in the book are all pretty good moms, and the dads are all pathetic losers. Yeah, <laughs> like like Oscar's dad sucks in his own way. Staffan is a horrible potential father figure. But like, I think Tommy's mom is fine. I mean, even Oscar's mom is fine. Yvonne is basically nervous around uh, Stefan or Stefan as well. If yeah, because mm-hmm. I actually really appreciated the moment where um, at the end of that chapter where she's smoking outside. And she says, yeah, you're going to have to promise me that you won't do anything until the morning. And maybe I'll give you the key if you're nice to me. I'm like, good. Assert yourself, Yvonne. Assert yourself. Even after all that shit he said, like, I like to it. think after what happened. She was like, you know what? I need to take care of my son. You yeah. can go away. <laughs> yeah. Staffan needs to go. You're you're fucked. So. Staffan needs to go. Chekhov's gun shooting trophy, though. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. <sighs> that was a good scene. That was pretty intense. Yeah. Um, uh, Oscar? Yeah, because... It's time to talk about Oscar. I feel like all of Oscar's parts are fairly are basically tame compared to everything else that happens. He, so he's, he's pretty much come to terms with Elay being a vampire and he thinks he's going to become one too because of the whole blood moment. And the part that was kind of really cute and I was just like kind of laughing a little was when he didn't want to get out of bed or something and he tells his mom, I'm going to become a vampire. And his mom's just like, oh, are you kidding me? You watch too many cartoons. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Um, that was really cute. 
that was I don't know I can't, is that before or after all this shit with Hawken? But yeah, it's, it was, it's hard to tell. But I can't. It's all a blur of blood and vi- viscera and and awful things. But yeah, I still feel the worst for Oscar because like. God, everything goes so bad for him. He feels like he's disconnected from everything. He's disconnecting from his mom. He's disconnecting from the life he had. And, but, and, you know, there's, there was, Ile was in a weird way. He, he let her into his life and she, in the end, benefited him. Even if at the same time, you gotta wonder, she's, she's also kind of using him, you know? But there's, but the thing is, you read enough of the book deeply, you realize they do care about each other. Oh, Ile's not just they using do. him. Yeah. She cares about him. Like she actually cares about him. And, mm-hmm. Well, like, and, Oscar did have some doubt leading up to, in, like, tor- in the last part, in part three, he had his doubts about whether Elay was using him or not. And there was a brief moment where they have this, this short little kiss, and he sees himself from Elay's perspective. I loved that. I know. That was really cute. So now he knows, oh, no, Elay does genuinely feel for me, so he can be at peace with his own feelings. But with the whole, like oh, I don't exist anymore, like, my life has changed. He, There was sort of this, like, oh, no, I don't exist anymore. But also, I kind of took it more as, like, he was a part of him. Maybe he didn't know it, but he was kind of also eager to, like, relinquish that. Because then when Eli does leave and he's like, should I go back to school? Uh, You know, he just kind of, like, was disappointed in a way. Mm Mm-hmm. That he was still there? I don't yeah, know. Like, he wanted, he didn't, he, it's like, you've had this experience, you've come this close, you've seen that much. Coming back to a normal life, mm-hmm. that's, again, this this book takes place over the course of, what, three weeks? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's not the same boy he was three weeks prior. Like, mm-hmm. cripes. A lot happens even after Elay. well, even right around when Elay is going to leave and he's rushing back, he has that incident where Jimmy and, or it, was it Jimmy and Johnny, or was it just Johnny who sticks, tries to shove his Johnny and Mick, and or shove his head onto the platform, make it look like he's gonna he's gonna get decapitated by the train. That's right. Oh, that's I right. think. Yeah, that was Johnny and Tomas. That was Johnny and Tomas. Mick wasn't. There. Um, because when he so he has that moment and uh that sucked, but then later when he goes to he sets. Johnny's locker and Tomas's locker, but he doesn't burn the other guys. I mean, not like it mattered either way. That guy still like worked against him at the end, but um... no. But Mick didn't realize that they were gonna kill, like straight up murder Oscar. Mm-hmm. He thought it was a prank, but no, they were gonna they were gonna kill Oscar. Well, so their motive behind that because we, we haven't mentioned that at all in the previous part. Was it this part or the or part three or part four where uh, Johnny gets the photo album from from uh, his brother, older brother, Timmy, that they got from their dad? That was part three, right? That was part three. Yeah, yeah part three. Um, so we have a scene where he puts it. Johnny puts the, the photo album in his school lot in his school desk. And guess what gets burned with his death? The photo album. Yeah. So that's why they go after Oscar. Well, because... they were going to go after him anyway, because cause, cause Johnny's ear got fucked up. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, now we're just going to reassert ourselves. And then, of course, uh, Oscar not taking no shit, he fucks up the thing where he's going to set their desks, you know, just charcoal their desks and almost sets the school on fire, has no idea about the photo album. And then, of course, that's the death sentence, basically, for both. Mm-hmm. Well, I think like if it, if that album hadn't gone up in flames, then it would have just been more bullying from Tomas and from Johnny. The bro- older brother wouldn't have gotten involved if if it wasn't for the loss of that album. Yeah, exactly. But um, that that part was also really intense though. At the very end, like they set this whole thing up and they like cold clock Mr. Avila. Yeah. Oh, we have to talk about Mr. Avila because like. He he's a dope teacher. Like yes. I really like grew to love him because he was like, "Did you set the fire? You set the fire. I won't tell anyone. I got you." <laughs> he's so good. He's like one not shitty adult male that Oscar meets. <laughs> mm. I feel like he he must have some in, like a really interesting background. Like that was just my personal assumption that like. He had maybe some kind of like really dark criminal background, but then he like came, well, he like turned a new leaf and became a teacher in another country. Well, and they just, say like, he used to be like a fighter pilot or something. Like there was something uh, he was he was in the military. I know that. 
Mm. Before he became a, a, a gym coach, basically. Yeah, because he likes his drills, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Mr. Avila, just, man, he was a cool guy. I Yeah, he... I hope he recovers well from his concussion. Oh, gosh, I hope so, too. I'm suddenly remembering what happened to... Uh... Oh my gosh, in Five Midnights, uh, Father, um, Padre, no! Padre, Sebastian. Padre Sebastian. Sebastian, Sebastian. Yeah, he was good. Yeah, he was good too. Yeah, just these, these good, these good father, fi- these good pseudo father figures, of course, obviously. Uh, but yeah, he got hit. AKA possible daddies for all of us. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> like, come on. Um, Mr. Via sounds really hot. Let's be honest here. I mean, yeah, he did to me, but he just seemed cool. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I mean, Padre Sebastian. Padre sounded... Sebastian is a different case, of course. But yeah, you know. I mean... but that's 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 five midnight here. Everybody grosses me out. Okay, so so Johnny and and Jimmy get their just desserts when fucking Ile rips their heads off. Yeah, and we don't we don't see it happen. Like we don't read it happen. We just hear that. We just hear it through through other people. That I've. I kind of like this image of Eli saying, "You have to ask me to come in." What? Like as they're basically about to kill Oscar, you have to ask me to come in. Uh, you can come in. Boom! Kills. I think the way they yeah. described what happened was because they talked about something. It looked like there was something under her arms. We've seen her sprout wings before. Oh uh, wait, she can. The bat wings. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I know she has like teeth and claws and stuff like that. She has a vampire form. She straight form. up got some vampire form. So she, but they call, cause they described her as an angel, but she busts through, kills Jimmy. Like we learned in, in hindsight, she busted through, killed, uh, Jimmy and Johnny and basically spirited Oscar away. And no mm-hmm. one's seen him since. And, um, you know what? It's, it's so cool. Cause I like, I think one of the things that this book, oh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get to this cause I want to talk about some of the questions we got, we got asked, you know? But there's like I think the thing that this vamp the vampire lore hedges so hard on in this book is definitely the idea of being invited in mm-hmm. as such an integral part. I mean, the um, book's called "Let the Right One In." Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like that uh, of all the things that the book kind of makes its like deep theme. It's that silly one of the silliest vampire tropes when you think about it that they have mm-hmm. to be invited in in order to do anything. So, but it is shown what happens. They actually say. Oscar does stop her and say, well, what happens if you just walk in and if I don't invite you? And then she starts bleeding from every um, orifice in her body until he says, okay, you can come in, and then stops completely. That's so interesting. There's so much we don't know about the curse, the infection, whatever you want to call it. But uh, what do we think of the ending where Oscar's on the train with the big the big creepy box and all the other boxes? The big the boxes in the big giant trunk. The one that probably has uh, Elay in it. That we know has Eli in it, yeah. <laughs> we already know, like he he doesn't want to go back to that to the life he had. Like he is, he is, he can't see himself in that. He won't function in it the same anymore. So it makes sense that he's just gonna leave with Eli because Eli can't stay. Yeah. Uh, he and he's just gonna leave with her. What I feel terrible is for Oscar's mother. I know. I feel so bad for Oscar. Because she's like. Like even their like their last time together because Eli whisks him away from the the pool. Um, their last little moment together, he just, just up and leaves while she's still on the phone. And oh, that poor woman. But um, yeah, no, it it made sense. And there's even that note because uh, we don't get that last scene where he's on the train from Oscar's perspective. So we don't know what he's thinking. It's from the 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 train guy checking the tickets or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he makes this note of how happy Oscar looks. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess it's a happy ending. <laughs> Is it, though? After everything. It's I a mean, happy ending for Oscar, for sure. I mean, until Oscar maybe gets older and he starts, the, his mentality is going to change as he gets older. So I wonder how that will, and Eli's won't. Eli's going to stay a child forever. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I wonder. That's what I think about. But yeah. Um, Honestly, the image of him on a train with Ile in the trunk is something that kind of came to me, or um, that idea that he would be with Ile and helping her out did come to me before I first read this or had any idea of what the story was about going into it. Just by reading the first chapter, I'm like, yeah, I think he's going to, the ending's going to be with him and her together. Like, mm-hmm. I-, I had no doubt in my mind that would happen, and it's, 
it's the type of ending that would be expected. My my thought process in terms of what might happen after the story uh, is that e is that Ile and Oscar will end up just being vampires together. I think at some point maybe Oscar will be a few years down the road and then he'll be like, you know what? Let's be vampires together. Let's just do it. I, I can see him doing that. I can see that happening in maybe like a year or two as like you know, maybe puberty starts to set in. He's like, no, I don't I don't want to become an adult and leave Eli behind. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe at that point he'll have been exposed to enough shit that he's just like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, in a weird way, he almost start the way that this starts almost reminded me of like the way we saw it, it, it's kind of bookended because you think about like how when we first see Hawken, he's on a train looking for, you know, he's there by himself looking for a victim for Elay. Here's Oscar on a train essentially doing what Hawken was doing before being her caretaker. But now but they're together sort of on this train. And it's my hope is that it's going to be different now. Like there now there's this. There's this, you know, friendship, this trust, this um, understanding between these two. It's warped, sure, because, I mean, it involves killing people to feed Elay, but at least it's not a predatory relationship in the same well, way. Well, I feel like, because we saw Elay instead of, Elay could have just killed Tommy down in that basement. Yeah. But instead, not wanting to upset Oscar, she paid for his blood. Yeah. So... Eli could maybe, because of Oscar's influence, be like, no, we're not going to, you're not going to kill anyone anymore. Instead, you're, we're going to just offer people money for blood because they got money. Anyway. Yeah. Um, All that money. I, don't know. <laughs> I do appreciate that Tom, uh, Oscar left a bunch of the money for Tommy mm-hmm. at the end. That was nice too. Mm. <sighs> wow. So I have a few questions. Um, one of the questions I asked uh, was, about the book, but also what do they think of vampires in general? And um, I got a couple of responses. Do you mm-hmm. want to begin with the vampire or with the book questions? Book questions. Okay. Both are from Brian um, or Tabletop DM is how he refers to himself on our Discord. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. How do you feel this book adds to Vampire Alert? And how has this book made an impact on vampires in me- the media? It's hard to say because this book came out in 2004, and... I mean, it did. we did get a really good movie from it, because I saw the movie originally. And uh, I, when it comes to, like, adding to vampire lore, I don't know if it, if it really added to it, because my, my thoughts on vampire lore, it's whatever you want it to be, because mm-hmm. everyone can... That's why I love vampires so much, because you can just kind of... You can kind of customize them to your taste, I guess. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, so I don't really think it it added too much to vampire lore as a whole. But I think what it did with its own vampire lore was just fucking amazing. Chef kiss, I loved it. You know. Yeah, I don't think it made an impact as much as it subverted um the ideas people tend to have about vampires. Um, this is now about a focus on a very young vampire, a 12-year-old vampire. And, I mean, we this has happened before. They did that in an uh, interview with a vampire with Claudia. I mean, she was mm-hmm. probably one of the first to do so. Yeah. But this is almost like we're just focusing on Claudia alone rather than the whole vampire. The whole hierarchy and, yeah, mm-hmm. all the really gothic stuff. And this portrays... Uh, vampirism as an infection or a disease rather than a group of people or a... Or a, like a, a supernatural entity of sorts. Exactly. It kinda, I mean, it, it kind of... It kind of... It's on the line there, but at least from the way our vampires in the story described it, to them it was more of a, a disease or infection. They didn't see themselves as something supernatural. No. Yeah, it takes the glamour away from it. You know, so many vampires, yeah. and, I'm not, and I'm okay with the, uh, I, there's nothing wrong in my mind if it's done correctly with the idea of the vampire being a tragic gothic character who has this supernatural mm. affliction, this curse. And charisma. <laughs> and charisma, yeah. but they have like, they have, you know, it's it's the Dracula thing. Here, yeah, vampires yeah. are, they the, the way it is, they feel gritty, they feel dirty, they feel diseased, and they feel... Hopeless. I mean, we're only getting the perspective of really one vampire. 
But the few other references we get, you feel like you feel that feeling of like you definitely get that sense that this is a sickness, especially when you, mm-hmm. you're getting it from Virginia's perspective. I think at some point we should probably should read Interview with a Vampire by Anne Rice. I think we should. I'd like to read it. Because that book definitely had an influence on vampire lore. Like that mm. actually did influence how we portrayed vampires in media. I just think this story kind of subverted all of that. And instead of making vampires seem glamorous, it's more tragic than anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's on some level still very fantastical, but it's that isn't the word you would immediately use to describe it. It's like like uh, David said, it's it's kind of dirty and gritty and very um, one of my favorite words, visceral. Visceral. Um, it's so visceral. Yes, it is. <laughs> I feel like this story doesn't so much add to vampire lore, but it definitely adds to the idea of like a that vampire romance, like human vampire romance, you kind of like the tragedy of it, you know, if it existed. Mm-hmm. Um, also, another uh, question from Brian is: Do you feel vampires have fallen out of fashion? I don't think never. That... Yeah, <laughs> I'll love them forever. <laughs> I, I I can't imagine vampires ever falling out of fashion. I think there's always going to be a when it comes to monsters in general. There's always going to be like, oh, we're going to be more interested in werewolves right now. Or yeah, it comes in in tides. There's like a lull where they kind of you know, not everyone's talking vampires, but you know they're they're always going to be there. You're always gonna have your your vampire. Cause so, I mean, like, I'm really excited for um the what we do in the shadows. The new season's gonna start, I think, next week. So I'm hey. just like, yes, give me that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it 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 there's the lull, but it's always gonna kind of like cycle back uh, in popularity. I think. What's uh, the current trend right now? Would you say in terms of uh horror stories or monsters that people want to get more out of? Um, we're kind uh, of pseudo, we're kind of post creepy pasta, which I felt like was so prevalent for a little while in um, a lot of ways. I think of like main, main media wise, I feel like we're in a weird spot where we're not too, too much into monsters. Cause like we had Twilight raise vampires for a while. Fuck you, Twilight. And then we had the <laughs> dead. So everyone was into zombies for a while i feel like right now with the situation of the world maybe monsters ain't so much on everybody's mind and everyone's watching things more like contagion and whatnot <laughs> um true i feel like true I, crime I would love to see really spiked, oh but... true crime really fucking spiked yeah i yeah. think there's a possession thing going on uh but i feel like mm-hmm. it's more force than anything yeah. I feel like it's always sprinkled in among everything. I would love to see werewolves have their time in the spotlight for a while. Yeah. I feel like they don't... Have they ever had, really? Um, I don't know. I think maybe there might have... Yeah, uh, Teen Wolf for a well, little bit, I, maybe. I was, was going to say the 80s was probably a, their time, because that's when American Werewolf in London came out. Yeah. And, um... Again, Teen Wolf. Uh, yeah, that there was actually a little bit of a uh, werewolf thing going on, and then I think Twilight also brought in the werewolf fans as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I feel like right now we're in the in the lull. Like there isn't really the a monster that everyone's like fangirling for right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not not really. We're in a little bit of a. I mean, maybe in a little bit of a limbo there, but I don't know. Hmm. Because I'm thinking like. The horror films that have come out are more kind of realistic horror than anything, or they are trying to make a comment like, oh, on the political yeah. world today. Yeah. Because, I mean, the most recent things that we've had that have been really good successes, like Midsommar and Hereditary and um, uh, Get Out, or not Get Out, Us. Uh, us. Yeah. Us is sort of thinking. I was, I swear I was not listening to the Us soundtrack <laughs> earlier. It was literally an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a lot of the the more successful ones lately have been more more commentary on on things. Well, the world is already kind of a horror show anyway, and society yeah. is slowly but surely yeah. collapsing. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, it's kind of good to look at. Look, we're kind of looking in the mirror right now. I'm seeing, see this, see this, this is horror. You know, that kind of thing. 
Sorry, not to make it like heavy, but fuck. <laughs> Um, I'm going to bring it up a bit. Thank you. Uh, We got a couple of vampire questions and these are more sillier than anything. So just to lighten the mood and then, and then end it on a very even lighter note. Uh, Slime Beast asked a question, but actually this is not a bad one. Implying Slime Beast ever asks a bad question, (laughs) Kayla. I mean, one that's not, I mean, it's a joke question, but it's one that I'm like, oh, actually that's not, it's one that can be discussed. Would a vampire be too grossed out to drink a nosebleed? I don't think no. so. No, I I disagree. Considering considering Virginia was thinking about uh that moment when like, you know, she remembered uh the birth and all she could fixate on was the blood and how she wanted to lick the blood off everything, including you know, between the legs, and I was like, Yeah, I could see a vampire seeing someone get a nosebleed and going like, get over here. <laughs> <laughs> don't tilt your head back just come over here that's oscar and eli's relationship now anytime that he has a nosebleed or gets cut oh dang it eli's like come here i'll get it lap 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 like a cat <laughs> um that's actually i don't, so yeah i think that's a resounding that's a resounding no i don't think unless they're one of those really prudish vampires you know you know like we're talking about the gothic ones that like i never drink vibe you know? here here's an interesting one i don't think atomica read the book but uh, would a vampire be a good candidate for a blood donor job? Uh, no, they need all the product. <laughs> yeah, I feel like they would rob. They would that's spend like, more time skimming from blood banks than they would. Yeah, that's like saying I would make a good sushi chef. <laughs> hey, hey uh, now. You're an all-star. <laughs> I want to eat everything that I make at work. <laughs> that, honestly. We got any final thoughts on this book before we put... A fucking plus. This is a great book. Yeah. It's it's uncomfortable as shit, but man, is the writing good, and it's like it sucks you in like a vampire, and doesn't let you go like a vampire. And then at the end, you feel drained like you would have been if you'd met a vampire. If all of you out there can handle content, the graphic writing. nature of some of the content, or just the severity there i yeah very very serious like if you are if you are sensitive to certain topics and you don't want to hear even one bit about you know anything terrible happening to children in any capacity do not read this book yeah don't don't do it i think i would be very careful about who i recommend this one to i'm gonna presume either you've read the book or you don't give a shit and you want to know what we think about it anyway. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a little punch drunk over here. And it's okay, because, like, not that there's punch. I wish there was. <laughs> I actually look forward to when we go in depth in with another novel similar to this. I mean, this has been so much fun. Yeah. And, yeah. I I'm glad. Do, uh, I want to do more like that... this. He's like multi-month or he can read a longer book and we can really break mm-hmm. it down and talk about it. This has been a really good experience. Yeah, I think with this one... It's definitely one that I, if we had tried to do this one in one month, I don't think we could have encompassed everything in that one episode. Like, I'm really glad we broke this up into the four uh, and just really got to savor and soak in that bathtub of blood. <laughs> that is this book. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, there's a uh, quite a, few um horror novels that i feel deserve that sort of treatment as well figure out how are we going to read this i think this is the best way to do so Mm -hmm. uh but next month we are not going to do that we're gonna focus on uh one book alone and actually i mean we're looking at the whole franchise it's goosebumps everybody yay and something uh, light uh, snap (laughs) oh snaps And uh, thank you, everyone, by the way, who voted and um, contributed your ideas and suggested, oh, which Goosebumps books we should read and voted, not just voted on Twitter, but also for our Discord. If you'd like to join our Discord for Creative Horror, you can uh, join Patreon for any of our uh, Creative Horror associated podcasts. This includes Midnight Marinara and uh, Undercooked Analysis, as well as um, Alan's. And I believe if you join his, that also gives you access to the Discord. If you want to partake in in future polls on what we're reading or just keep up with any creative horror-related podcast news or what we're all up to as a group collectively, follow us on Twitter at creative underscore horror on Twitter. 
Um, check out the website, creativehorror.com. And yeah. Also, you check also- out our YouTube page as well. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, our YouTube just hit 100 subscribers. <laughs> I'm so proud of us. Uh, for those of you who <laughs> followed my uh, the old Midnight Marinara and Undercooked Analysis podcast feeds on YouTube, I'm happy to report that those are now being re-uploaded slowly but surely because there's quite a backlog, uh, at least for Midnight Marinara, to uh, YouTube. As I've explained a few times, we're, we're not uploading certain episodes because of the way that YouTube's copyright system works and how easily people have been able to exploit it to take down the old Midnight Marinara channel. So because there's no justice in this world, I've decided that I'm going to be play it safe and upload content that we consider, you know, completely permissible and, you know, subject to fair use within complete Mm. understandable reason uh, to the channel. And there's some old stuff I'm going to re-upload that I think is safe, but mostly it's going to be the art. You can start listening to the archives of Midnight Marinara there if you want to. And hey, other sort of things that come up through down the pipe every so often on uh, the Creative Horror YouTube page. And now... It's uh, time to reveal the winner for the Goosebumps book that we are going to be reading. Ooh, it got me chills. The goose flesh. I mean, bumps. I mean, popping up <laughs> my arms. What is our, uh, what are we reading? And the winner is... Drum roll, please. The Horror at Camp Jelly Jam. Yay, the haunted... Wait, what? Yes. <laughs> we are reading The Horror at Camp Jelly Jam. Which is the 33rd book in the original Goosebumps series. I, I, uh, I, I mean, we put it up on a poll. We, we should also announce that we will be joined by none other than the Alan Chaney for that episode. Alan. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Alan championed for that book. And yes, when Alan wants something, Alan usually gets it. So. God damn it, Alan. <laughs> I think. Well, I think we should do, like, we'll do Camp Jelly Jam or whatever, uh, and then maybe after another book or two, we'll come back and do another Goosebumps book. Or maybe every, every time we need a nice palate cleanse or easy episode, we can come back to a Goosebumps I book. I think that's totally fair, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, th- uh, also along with talking, like, reading Camp Jelly Jam, I think one of the things we'll do too is talk about Goosebumps popularity and why it resonated with kids during the 90s and mm-hmm. um cuz i mean for a while this was one of the most popular book series yeah scholastic took this and ran with it man. oh absolutely and i mean it was everywhere at some point and i want to talk about that that like yeah. this, it's more than just the story itself but or the book itself it's- we're we're going to kind of overview the phenomena uh, that it was goosebumps as we talk about the horror at Camp Jelly Jam. <laughs> you know what? I, I've read it too. I, it's been a while, but I remember mm-hmm. it, it very vividly. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I <laughs> I can't wait to talk about it with Ellen. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight for this. Be careful at night, everyone. Uh, watch out for vampires. Watch out for people who don't let vampires. them in. Don't don't, don't let, let them, them in. in. Never. If like, they ask, if they say you could, yeah, you come in, you have to say I'm invited in. Just if they ever express that, just don't, just don't let them. Never let them in. Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinara, and this podcast is part of CreativeHorror.com, a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at creativehorror.com. <laughs>